Good morning, church. Ooh, hello. It's good to see all of you here today on this beautiful November morning, uh, or maybe, depending on your uh, view of fog and rain and all that fun stuff. But either way, it's, uh, it's nice and, and warm in here with the encouragement we can bring to each other as we uh, kind of move forward into a, a busy season. We've got later on this month the uh, carry-in on the 24th. Don't forget to uh, sign up for different dishes in the, uh, the foyer. There's a sign-up sheet in there, yeah, as well as different things that you can bring to, to be ready for that. It'll just be right after service uh, on the 24th. We're really looking forward to that uh, and all the fellowship and encouragement that that brings. Uh, so let's start out our service in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time of praise and worship that you've given to us. And God, today we thank you for your word and how it inspires us, how it challenges us, and how it gives us hope in times of struggle, in times of chaos, and it gives us direction uh, regardless of times of struggle or times of joy. And so, God, we thank you for that and how you are continuing to work in our lives through your word, through the influence of the Holy Spirit. And God, we pray that that's happening this morning, that as we gather here today, that it, this isn't just something we cross off our checklists, but it's something done out of devotion to you and that we leave here as better followers of you. It's in your son's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we begin in worship. Let your glory go on and on. 
book of John in chapter 1, uh, John introduces us to the story of Jesus with these words. He writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So when we think about the words of God we read in Scripture, and then the true word, that is Jesus Christ. Uh, he helps to be a light in our darkness, and helps to lead us when we feel like we don't know which direction to take. of all mankind because of the sacrifice that he made on the cross and the hope that he brings us because of the resurrection. Man, a 
sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betrayed the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid silent as he stood accused beaten mocked and scorned and bowing to the Father's will he took a crown of gold. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. And now my soul cries out, Hallelujah, praise and honor. Run to thee. Sent up heaven, God's own Son, to purchase and redeem and reconcile the very ones who nailed him to. That my Jesus spilled, and now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. The curse of sin has no hold on me. The sun sets free. sending your son Jesus here to this world to teach us, to guide us, 
and then one day to die for us and to take our sins to the cross. God, we thank you for that, and we thank you for the resurrection that brings us a new hope, uh, hope over the, the sins of this world, hope over death itself. And God, we pray that we remember that sacrifice here as we're about to take communion. It's in your son's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning. Am I on? There I am. Good morning. Um, it's good to see everybody here and fill this house with praise this morning. Thank you, Stephen, for leading us in that. It was great. Um, I'm not going to say anything new this morning. I'm going to cheat. I'm just going to copy Greg. He's so abashed by that. No. Um, but really, I was... Um, listening to him the other week, and I'm just going to go off of what he said a little bit, actually, so I'm not lying. Um, he was talking about um, passion, and um, he read the definition of passion um, with Christ, um, and it was a strong liking or devotion to something. Um, and a lot of times, you know, we have passions that we talked about, like fishing or just hobbies, basically something that we like to do. And he challenged us to be passionate about Christ. Um, and as Christians, that's our, our main goal or, or should be our main focus. And I was sitting there thinking about it, and I was like, hmm, why do we call it the passion of the Christ? Like, you know, he went to the cross. Why do we call it that passion? And part of that's the emotion that was behind it. But I was thinking, I was like, man, what was Jesus passionate about? Because it surely wasn't suffering and dying. He, he himself didn't necessarily want to do that if that's not what he had to do. And I was thinking, I was like, man, he's passionate about us. That's why he did that. That's why they called it the passion, because he was devoted to us in his life. And just thinking about even if he was to die just for just me alone, not alone the whole world, but just you by yourself, I think he still would have done it just for one of us. Um, and I was thinking that's pretty cool. Um, you know, so if you think about that, it's really kind of a, a heavy thought, this how, how Christ is, loves me so much and I'm so unworthy of that. And that can be, I mean, I, you could be sitting there kind of in pity almost thinking, man, does, am I really worthy of this? Or I know I'm not worthy of this at all. And it's almost like my heart is in unrest in that. Um, but I think, you know, part of that could be sin in our lives. A lot of times sitting there thinking, man, I have this sin. I feel so unworthy of what Christ has done for me. But I think part of that's the spirit working us in us to convict us to get the turn, try and expel the sin out. But um, part of it, too, um, I would just invite you that if you're stuck in that to, to not be stuck but to um, in your sin, but rather to um, devote yourself to Christ and commit yourself to God's word and to this church body. And um, really what he was saying then, where um, you're supposed to be passionate about Christ, and that will eventually lead you out of that sin. You know, It's not going to be um, avoiding the sin or thinking that's the one thing you're trying to get out of but um, you'll eventually fill that with either other sins or other things in your life that don't matter. What you really have to do is point yourself to Christ, and that will lead you out of that sin. Um, so with all that, um, just having the knowledge that um, we were bought with a price, um, and we're supposed to be passionate about Christ for that, because that's what he was to us. So I'm going to read um, a little section from 1 John that kind of sums all that up. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, 
and to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him, and he is in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. So we know that by the spirit. Let us go to prayer. God, we just thank you for the love you gave us through Jesus. We thank you for helping us um, through our wrestling and through our doubts. We just thank you for the peace you can give us. And we just ultimately thank you for this church and um, the life that can be found in you. Um, and now we just um, commend this time to you and that we can be closer to you. Amen. If you do not have your elements, you can get them at this time. Otherwise, we're going to reflect on that. thinking to that night when Jesus went to that cross and the elements, when he was willing to give his body for his friends and for his believers and ultimately for us, let us partake of the bread. And then thinking of his blood that he would spill for his disciples and ultimately for us. Let us partake of the juice. Let us go to prayer again. God, we thank you for the communion we can partake of. We thank you for the believers around us that can help us in this life and encourage us. And we pray that we would want to have spirits of you and that we could encourage those around us. We pray that as we worship and as we give unto this church and to the people of this earth, that we would do so with good spirits and um, that we would just listen to this message and that it can help us throughout the week. Amen. I guess there's an announcement here I'm supposed to read. Um, anyone interested in donating to the holiday baskets, please see Cindy Meyer in the lobby after the service. Uh, this is going to be done at the next trifocal meeting. Also, um, Thanksgiving meals coming up rapidly, and uh, we hope a lot of the college students are going to be able to come and join us with uh, that meal. And with that in mind, um, if you signed up to bring something, uh, bring a little extra. Uh, we want to make sure we've got plenty of food uh, to take care of the young people here that are with us. Ah, we got a birthday girl here this morning. I didn't know about that, but it was brought to my attention, so don't blame me. Um, Janice Wilson. How old are you today? Do you mind telling? Is this your birthday? And how young are you? 92. Very good. I think we ought to sing happy birthday to her. Stephen, you want to start that? I sure can't. <laughs> oh, it's Kennedy's birthday? How old are you? Where's she at? Oh, you pointed when you said that. So how old is she? Do you know? Nine-ish? Okay. <laughs> Let's see, that is your um, sister and first cousin, right? Did you get her something? Yeah, you! Did you get her anything? <laughs> Candy. <laughs> is that right? All right, good job. All right. Anyway, let's sing Happy Birthday to Jan. Let's go ahead and start it.
<laughs> Good to see you here this morning. Do you need some help or something? Or? Oh, okay. All right. Anyway, um, one more thing on a more serious note before we uh, go any farther. Most of you know tomorrow's Veterans Day. And uh, I always feel that we are remiss if we don't take the opportunity, especially uh, this time of year, to recognize any veterans uh, that we may have with us this morning. So if you're a veteran this morning, please stand up. We thank you. Uh, we're indebted to your service. Okay, um, this morning we're going to do a little review. Um, we're going to wrap up the series uh, that I started back on September the 22nd. Um, if you were here for the first three sessions, uh, this will be a review for you. If you missed out on one or more of them, it'll get you up to speed. I appreciate um, Stephen filling in the last two weeks. Uh, I enjoyed last week being able to sit back in the back and uh, listen to a sermon. So our fall break started on October the 6th. So we have had an extended fall break from this series. So let's review. If you remember, first of all, in this four-step process, uh, we looked at what God created the church to be. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 26. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. And then we looked at the three things that the church ought to be. Number one, it is to be a place where we encourage one another. Number two, it is to be a place where we motivate one another. And number three is to be a place where we help one another deal with the struggles of life and the schemes of Satan. In other words, God created the church to be a place of one anothering. And unless a church has people determined to be involved with each other, uh, you don't have a church. You just have a building. Then you remember we talked about that Sunday, the 10-5-2 rule. The 10 part of it, if you come within 10 feet of anybody, from the time you get out of the car to the time you get back in your car after the service, then you go over and greet them. Uh, say hello to them. Tell them you're glad to see them. Then the five, uh, right after worship, try to use those five minutes to seek out someone you don't know. Introduce yourself. Get to know them a little bit. You know, it's so easy, and it's great to be together as families, but even then, we see each other all the time. So don't stand there as a family talking about what's going to go on or where you're going out to eat or something like that. Go find somebody else and talk to them. And then the number two, um, we should have a desire that nobody sits alone. If you see someone coming in and you recognize that person is a visitor, go sit with them. Uh, you're allowed to sit in different spots. You know, sometimes it's interesting to me. I started years ago sitting in the back of the church. You learn so much about the dynamics of worship when you sit at the back of the church instead of up front with your back to everybody where the preacher usually sits. I love it when somebody has their normal, this is where I sit every Sunday seat, and they walk in and somebody else is sitting there. There may be 40 other open seats, but they act like they don't know where to sit. And, and, and a lot of different things like that. But make sure nobody sits alone. If you see somebody standing out in the lobby, um, just kind of with that look on their face, like I don't really know anybody here, what I, should I be doing? Go talk to that person. That's the 10-5-2 rule. And the challenge is to commit ourselves to a deeper level of commitment to something that's extremely important to God. And that's that idea of one anothering. Step number two we looked at, creating a desire for people to want to learn more about Jesus. And what we looked at that week was Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well. And as we studied the woman at the well, we recognized that what Jesus did with her is the exact same thing we can do with people that we run into that we want to share with Jesus. Remember, I gave you three questions to answer. Or excuse me, he did three things that we looked at. First of all, he simply talked to her. Uh, we realized that it's important to talk to people, 
not at them. Secondly, he talked about spiritual things. He directed it towards their relationship to God. And then he talked about God. And then also, kind of as a caveat to that, we talked about the idea, never pass up the opportunity to pray for someone. You remember I mentioned that even in my own life, there's been times when I said, you know what, I'll pray for you. I'll, I'll pray for that, and then go on down the road. And, and I learned a while back, and I've been incorporating this into my life, if somebody shares something with me that needs to be prayed about, I don't care where I am, I don't care who's around, I say, let's pray. And we pray right there. Don't pass that opportunity up. Step number three, tell your story. First John 1.1, 1, 1. that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, <clears throat> we can proclaim concerning the word of life. And we talked about the fact that the unchurched haven't necessarily rejected God, they've rejected church. And a lot of times because of what they see in us. They want to know, they want to see if Jesus is really working in our lives. Then I gave you the three questions to answer that more or less tells your story. Number one, why did you become a Christian? Number two, why do you believe Jesus made a difference in your life? Number three, why are you a Christian? You answer those three basic questions. That's your story that you can share with other people when you come in contact with them and want to get them interested in Jesus themselves. Well, that brings us to the final step, step number four this morning, and that's his story. Really appreciate uh, Lee's communion medication this morning, the, the song Stephen chose, because it just folds right in, uh, perfectly dovetails in to what we're going to talk about this morning, because we need to realize that the cross is a central focus of Christ's story. And we're going to look at the question, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? Richard Bandelier, he's a speaker, he's a consultant uh, on self-help, talks about visiting a mental institution that he would go to quite often to try to work with the people. And he was told about an individual there who claimed that he was Jesus. Not spiritually, not metaphorically, but literally, this man felt like he was Jesus. And he told everybody that. <clears throat> so he went to meet the man. He said, I walked up to him. I said, are you Jesus? And he said, yes, my son. He said, I'll be back in a minute. Then he left. The guy claiming to be Jesus just kind of stood there. Within a few minutes, because he was prepared, he came back. Uh, holding a measuring tape, and said, hold your arms out straight. And he measured his arms. He said, stand up real straight. And he measured his height. He said, I'll be back in a minute. Again, the man claiming to be Jesus just stood there. He came back with some boards and nails and started putting together in the form of the cross. And the man claiming to be Jesus says, what are you doing? He said, once again, are you Jesus? The man said, yes, my son. He said, then you know why I'm here. Pretty soon the man said, no, I'm not Jesus. <laughs> and and Bandelier said in his book, isn't it interesting uh, that even a man in a mental institution understood that the cross was a part of the story of Jesus. He understood enough about Jesus and what Jesus went through when he was fo facing that potential pain himself, he immediately uh, decided he wasn't Jesus. Now, I don't know that any of us would be willing to go through what Jesus went through. Uh, the scourging, uh, those false trials, the crucifixion, and, and all that agony. None of us would be willing to go through that. But Jesus was and did. And that's why it's a central part of his story. Now, there are many who are uncomfortable with the cross today. There are churches, supposedly, that no longer want to have the cross uh, in their building. Uh, there are individuals who say that Jesus was not really wanting to be crucified, had no desire to have that happen in his life, didn't think it was necessary, but he was just a victim of unfortunate circumstances. Uh, the cross does make a lot of people uncomfortable. Um, but if you look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you can see all of them from the very beginning of the Gospel to the end almost building up uh, to the crucifixion, to that time there on Calvary. The book of Matthew uh, says a lot about that. Matthew 16, 21. 
From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Later on in Matthew 17, 22 and 23, when they came together in Galilee, he said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. Matthew 20, 17 through 19. Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the 12 aside and said to them, we're going to go up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests, the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death. They will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. And then again in Matthew 26, 1 and 2. Then Jesus said, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. So time and time and time again, as Jesus drew closer and closer to that point, he reminded his followers exactly what was going to happen. He told them over and over again. Now, is this something Jesus wanted to do? Let's look at Matthew chapter 26, 36 through 44. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not I will, as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter, Watch and pray, so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. So if we read this, and if I understand what Jesus here is saying to his father, I really don't want to do this. If there's any way possible that this can be completed, that the sins of mankind can be taken care of, other then me going through this, let it be so. But then, of course, he said, but if not, your will be done. So we have to understand that Jesus did not want to do this, but Jesus knew that he had to do this. It was a fulfillment of a prophecy made way back in the book of Genesis. And in order to understand that, I think we have to come to grips with some basic concepts in the Bible that we need to come to grips with so that, again, we can share them with other individuals when we come in contact with them, when we're going through that process that we just talked about, those first three steps. We've got to grasp this and be assured of it in our own hearts and be convicted of it. First of all, God loves you. God loves us. He created us. He created you in his image. You're, you're the crown of creation, in fact, that's one of the main focuses of probably everyone's most favorite verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's how much God loves each one of us. Uh, it, it's hard to love people. You know that as well as I do. There are some people that are just almost unlovable. Uh, a little girl named Nan wrote in a letter to God, I bet it's really hard for you to love everybody in the whole world. There's only four people in my family, and I can't love all them. And, and you know what I'm talking about here. It's, it's hard to love some people. And the Bible isn't saying that God just loved certain individuals. The Bible says God loved everyone, even the unlovable. Think about who Jesus spent time with. The prostitutes, sinners, tax collectors, the sick, the blind, the lame, the leprous, the social outcasts, the physically deformed. And I believe the message to us today is if Jesus, if God could love these people, then surely he can love us. Therefore, one of the first things we learn in Scripture is that God does love us. He cares for us. Secondly, even though God loves us, there is 
something that separates us from Him. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Our, our lives are contaminated. They're tainted. They're stained by sin, by, by the things that we've said, things that we've done, things that we've thought. In contrast, though, 1 John 1, 5, and 6 says, This is the message we've heard from Him and declare to you. God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him, and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. God is light. His light, as we read Scripture and look at the life of Jesus, exposes the sin within our own lives. Have you ever gotten ready to go out? Out to eat or something like that and you want you want to dress up a little bit and you you pull that favorite shirt out and you put it on and kind of getting some bright light and oh my gosh there's a stain there what do you usually do i'm not even gonna ask you jeff you usually go back in and, and you change that shirt and, and you put one on that doesn't have the stain on it why because we know that stains there we're going to be self-conscious we're going to be uncomfortable. We probably wouldn't be able to enjoy the fellowship of the people we're going to come in contact with if we saw that big old stain there on our shirt. Well, that's what sin does to us. It, it puts a stain on our soil, and in the presence of God, when we know that stain is there, we're embarrassed. We're uncomfortable, self-conscious. We really won't be able to enjoy the ultimate love that God has for us. Isaiah once came into the presence of God, and it so disturbed him. Listen to what he said in Isaiah 6, 5. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. So let's see. God loves us, but yet we have sin that has stained our lives, and that keeps us from truly enjoying the fellowship of God. How can we change that? How, how can we take that stain out of our lives. Now, one of my favorite things that's been invented, because, I don't know, every time I eat, it seems like I get something on me. I have no idea why. Have you heard of the Tide Stain Stick? Those things are sweet. <laughs> I keep one of those in my truck. And, and a lot of times when I go in to eat, I put it in my pocket, because all of a sudden, here's this stain, it just whip my old Tide, and pretty much takes care of it, you know. It's kind of a, a neat thing to do. But we can't do that with our sin. Well, we don't have some magic little tied stick that we can keep in our pocket. Oh, shouldn't have done that. And Okay, God, we're cool now. We can't do anything like that. Um, we can't resolve the problem of our own sin. We can't do enough good to be good enough to be in the presence of God. Paul wrote this in Titus 3, 3 through 5. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures, we lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. There's this chasm, if you will, between us and God. And God realized that we could not get over to him through our own goodness, through anything that we've done, we would be unworthy. We would have this stain that would not disappear. So God bridged the gap himself. John wrote in Revelation 1.5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Peter put it this way in 1 Peter 3.18, Christ died for sins once for all, the righteousness for the unrighteous to bring God to you. So what did God do? He did what we could not do. He gave us the avenue, the bridge, to cross over from that stained life into a forgiven life that can stand before God. But we've got to go one step farther. It's not good enough for know, to know that God's created that bridge. We have to choose to cross it. A couple of years ago, when Cindy and I were down in Florida... Um, one of the elders uh, that did a communion meditation, I thought, wow, I've, I've, I tried to find it online, but they don't archive that far back. I was just going to show it to you rather than try to describe it to you. But I just, 
I'll never forget it. I went up and talked to him afterwards. I said, man, I've, that's the greatest communion meditation, maybe even sermon that I've ever heard. And he said he was talking to his girls on Easter Sunday. And he was trying to get them to realize the death burial on Jesus and what it really meant. And he said, I had them stand over on one side and I put, I forget what, maybe something over on the other side. He says, here's God and here you are. But just try to imagine this ravine between you. And you can't get over there. It's impossible. So as he started talking about the crucifixion, as he talked about the death, burial, and resurrection, he said, I, I laid one board down and then I put another board across. And he said, okay, now I want you to walk from this side across the beam there to that side. He said, that's how we get to God. The cross made a bridge. The death, burial, and resurrection made a bridge where we can go from being alienated from God to be in the presence of God and find forgiveness of our sin. We have to choose to cross over. Now, how do we do that? This should be a refresher for you. Again, just a few questions you have to answer. Number one, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Number two, well, in Acts 16, 31, when this was presented uh, before those who wanted to know Jesus, uh, they were told, believe in the Lord Jesus, you'll be saved, you and your household. Second question, do you believe that you're a sinner? John 1, 8 says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Third question, are you willing to turn from your past and start living for him? This is repentance. Acts 3.19, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Number four, I hope you're answering these in your mind as we go through this. Are you willing to confess him as your Lord and Master? Romans 10.9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Then the final question, are you willing to be buried in the waters of Christian baptism to rise up a new creature? Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those are the questions. And unfortunately, a lot of times as we go through the first four, everybody's, yeah, 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 I don't, well, I don't, don't know about this last one. Not real sure about that. What, what, what do you mean, be buried in the watery grave of Christian baptism? Well, we know nobody disputes the fact that when Jesus went down to the River Jordan, where John was preaching repentance for the kingdom of God is at hand, and Jesus went down into the water with him, and John said, hey, I'm not even worthy to tie the strings on your sandals. But Jesus, remember what he said? Suffer to be so to fulfill all righteousness. He set the example of Christian baptism, immersion. And then, before he ascended up into heaven, what did he say? Go into all the world, teaching, preaching, repentance, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. A lot of symbolism in the Bible. What more could you think of as a symbolic act of being buried with Christ burying your sins and rising up into a new life and baptism. You're standing there in your old self, you're lowered into the water, you're buried. You can't breathe. You're under water there as a burial. You rise up with those sins washed away. You're a new creature in God. So when we come to grasp with that and we've made that decision in our lives, then it's easier to tell other people, to tell our story, to tell what Jesus means to us to tell us what he's doing in our life right now. There's a unique prison near the city of San Jose dos Campos in Brazil, South America. Uh, many years ago, the Brazilian government turned the prison over to two Christians. The institution was renamed Hamida, and the plan was to run the prison on Christian principles. With the exception of the two full-time staff, all work is done by inmates. Families outside the prison were encouraged to adopt an inmate to work with during and after his term. Chuck Colson, a name you're probably familiar with, passed away a while back. He was the founder of Prison Fellowship, uh, the nation's largest Christian not-for-profit serving prisoners and their families. He visited that 
prison. He'd heard of it. He wanted to see it. He made this report. When I visited, I found the inmates smiling, particularly the murderer who held the keys, opened the gates, and let me in. Wherever I walked, I saw men at, men at peace. I saw clean living areas, people working industriously. The walls were decorated with biblical sayings from the Psalms and Proverbs. My guide escorted me to the notorious prison cell once used for torture. Today, he told me, the block houses only a single inmate. As we reached the end of a long concrete corridor, and he put the key in the lock, he paused and asked, are you sure you want to go in? Of course, Colson replied, I've been in isolation cells all over the world. Slowly, he swung open the massive door, and I saw the prisoner in that punishment cell, a crucifix, beautifully carved by the inmates, the prisoner Jesus hanging on a cross. And the guys softly said, he is doing the time for the rest of us. I hope that if you've not really committed yourself to the Lord, that, that, that you do that, that you recognize what Christ has done for us and how much God loves each one of us. And if you've never truly accepted him as Lord and Savior, if you've not followed through on those questions I talked about, maybe you've come up to the edge and you stopped and you said, ah, I don't know about this baptism thing. Pray about it. Come and talk to us about it. That's what Jesus did. He opened up. He made that bridge to get us from here, lost in our sins, to here, saved by grace. You've got to choose to cross it. No one else can do it for you. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for, for your love. I, I pray that each person here this morning recognizes how special they are to you, how much you love them. Father, when tragedies, when, when I hear of tragedies, it, just, it breaks my heart. We, we, we pray for the Prairie Heights community, for the family of that young girl that committed suicide. I, I think to myself, what, what a waste of life. Nothing to live for. We have the hope, we have the peace, we have the assurance of being in the relationship with you, and we need to share that. We need to tell our story. We need to let people know how much God loves them, that they might find hope, that they might find a purpose. I pray that there may be one here this morning that needs to truly know you as Lord and Savior. May they respond, recognizing your love for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's be standing, shall we? Creation suddenly articulate oh, with a thousand tongues to lift one cry. Then from north to south and east to west, we'd hear Christ be magnified. With a whole Echoing his eminence, his name would burst from sea and sky, from the rivers to the mountain tops. We'd hear Christ be magnified. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise, Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me. When every creature Finds its inmost melody In every human heart Its native cry Then in one enraptured hymn of praise We'll sing Christ Be magnified Oh, Christ 
be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. to idols I'll stand strong and worship you and if it puts me in the fire I'll rejoice cause you're there too and I won't be formed by feelings I hold fast to what is true if the cross brings transformation then I'll be crucified with you cause death is just the doorway to resurrection life if i join you in your sufferings then i'll join you when you rise and when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints my heart will still be singing and my soul will be the same oh christ be magnified let his praise arise Christ be magnified in me Oh, Christ be magnified From the altar of my life Christ be magnified in me Oh, Christ be magnified Let his praise arise Christ be magnified in me, oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me. Good to see everybody here this morning. I hope you have a great day. Look forward to being back with you next week, Lord willing.